Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willig. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. John the Baptist appeared preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were coming out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. I love this time we spend together trying to digest this great food for our soul. That's uh, the diet of the gospel that is so nourishing. I, I love the fact that you make a commitment to come here. You take the time and trouble to make a point to really be here as often as you can. And I love this. And I hope uh, we continue to be able to do this and to find it really nurturing and encouraging of our life with the Lord. Already, I presume many of us are receiving Christmas cards. Uh, it always makes me feel a little guilty because I haven't even thought about it. But already we're receiving in the mail these cards and many of them are really beautiful. Some of them are truly inspirational. And it's, it's good to just take a moment to consider those pictures or cards that are particularly touching to us and take a moment with them and to let it sink in and let the message be driven home to our heart. But imagine if you received a Christmas card not with a picture of the creche or holy family and not a picture of an angel or a star in the sky, not even shepherds, or the winter scenery, imagine, rather, if you receive the card with the picture or portrait of John the Baptist on the cover, with his, of course, unkept hair, with his animal hide clothing, with his wild eyes on fire, with his fists full of wild locusts, and you open it up, you read the message in bold print that jumps at you. You brood of vipers! <laughs> Merry Christmas, John the Baptist. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture, we would say? But in fact, 
that's the picture, that's the message that our church and the gospel gives us in preparation for Christ's coming. Now, this should really make us take a step back and wonder, why is John the Baptist the one to announce the coming? Maybe to really wake us up and get our attention. But what is it? God, in his wonderful plan, chose this wild man to come to us with the message we need to hear if we're to welcome the Savior into our homes and hearts. Well, I hope this gospel can perhaps uh, invite that prophet to come forth and speak. And that's saying a lot, by the way, you know, because I don't think a lot of us would want to hear what maybe John would want to say. But I'll get to that little point later. Well, the gospel opens with this scene, and remember the setting is so important, with John appearing where? In the desert. And this is very significant and important. You know, the desert's not this vacation spot in Palm Springs with a wonderful resort. The desert, quite the contrary, was a place of chaos, of disorder, of real potential danger. Hardly anybody went out to the desert alone because it was a place they could easily be killed because of wild pirates who would attack you or wild animals that would attack you. The desert, however, was a place to retreat. It would be for us that place to get away from the phone and the television and all the noise of the city. The desert was a place for Israel to retreat, but it was a tough place of testing, of temptation. It was a place of preparation where they would undergo tremendous transformation before they could enter into the promised land. Where is our desert? When we're going through a really dry and difficult time, you're there. When we're really on the down and out, there we are in the desert, spiritually speaking. This is where John lived in, in this kind of austerity and deep spirituality. Scholars suggest that John probably, most probably, lived as a member of the Essene community in Qumran, which is just a few miles or uh, very close to the shore of the Dead Sea. In this desert area, and some of us were there when we went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, this community was a monastic community. You can imagine like what we know Gethsemane would be, very, very simple, austere life. In this barren desert, they devoted themselves to prayer, of course, and to a study of the scriptures. I might add, they went to the desert to get away from the evils of the world to really retreat, to live a holy life, wholly dedicated to God. The biblical archaeologists have unearthed these scriptoriums, these little rooms, if you will, that where they wrote very carefully translations and commentaries on the scriptures. And then they preserved these ancient parchments in the caves that surrounded their dwelling on the hillside. And it happened, as many of you know, in 1947, a 15-year-old Bedouin shepherd was out grazing the sheep and goats. And one of the goats had wandered off up the mountainside. So he took a stone and threw it up to get his attention and call him back to the herd. When he heard that the stone hit and he heard something crack and he thought, Aha, maybe a buried treasure lies here. And little did he know what a treasure. Because when he went back the next day, instead of finding gold, he found a gold mine of scriptures, these parchments of scripture that were written and preserved nearly perfectly in his desert climate for all the time since the time of Christ. And eventually, it's fascinating how this got to be sold on the market, and then somehow a scripture scholar got hold of it. Where did you find this? This is incredible. And they traced it back to this Qumran community. Make a long story short, biblical archaeologists went wild over this and found 
900 Dead Sea Scrolls, many of them the most ancient scripts we have of sacred scripture. Perhaps most amazing is the fact that when they compare, like they, they have an entire book of Isaiah rewritten on their parchments, it's nearly exactly what we have preserved to this day, what they had at the time. Can you imagine? I mean, that's really saying something when 2,000 years have transpired. In any case, they're even on display at the Shrine of the Book in Israel. But I bring all that to the point that one of the things that these Dead Sea Scrolls have helped reveal is not only these ancient manuscripts of Scripture, but also a commentary into this community of Qumran. And they learned that this community devoted themselves to ongoing conversion. And the way they ritualized this is through a washing or bathing. So they had all these baths and they to purify themselves. Remember, they were people very conscious of spiritual impurity. So you can understand then why if John the Baptist came from this kind of community, he would be of that mind in school to want to promote a kind of ritual purification or washing to call people as a ritual for conversion. And in fact, I'm told that the Essenes were the only people that we know who really practiced the constant purification rite for to realize the conversion in one's life. All that's wonderful background for us to understand who John was. Now, he's coming in that very desert place and preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, Matthew, actually, interesting, uses these same words that Jesus preaches another chapter later. Jesus says the same message. What I've come to understand, and when I spent some time in Israel, what our scripture teacher suggested, is Jesus was probably an early disciple of John. He would have been obviously acquainted with him through his very kinship. Remember, uh, Elizabeth and Mary were to what we know to be cousins. And Jesus would have been taken by this man who's on fire with such desire to be a preacher for God. And, And Jesus probably would have listened to him and no doubt taken from John the same message that would, that would have set his heart on fire. Jesus, I think, did it in a little more gentle style, but who's to say what John's purpose was certainly to grab people's attention, and their attention he really got. His whole preaching could be synthesized perhaps in this one line, repent, for God's kingdom is at hand. In other words, God, when we hear God's kingdom, we might as well say God, God's presence is right here, right now. In other words, we always want to put it off, put it off. It was interesting in my parish, one of our young students' father died, 36 years old, and it just sent a shock wave out to all the young men in our parish, especially like, oh my God. And I noticed that the attendance of church just went up a little bit Sunday. When you realize the time is right now, I mean, it does get our attention. But when John says repent, you know, what is, what does that mean? For John, it meant a whole lot more than feeling sorry for our sins. Do you understand the kind of conversion we're being asked to do in this season of preparation for Christ's coming is to name our sin and then realize what we need to do to turn around, turn it around and turn to God. So it's a two-prong approach of repenting that we need to do. You've heard it. Uh, maybe it's silly and you've heard this before, but I just think of it now. The guy who was trying to save on his painting job and he'd, so he watered the paint down and he and painting the church and the priest came later and saw it was streaky. And, it, and the priest said, hey, now look, I want you to repaint in thin no more. <laughs> anyway, it's silly. John the Baptist we're told in, in Matthew quotes the uh, prophet Isaiah when he says, The voice that cries out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Matthew is quoting Isaiah because he finds that 
This passage is fulfilled perfectly in John the Baptist. He's presenting John as is a perfect example of a prophet. You know, a prophet is one who speaks for God, a messenger of God. Have you ever heard someone and you're listening to them and you say, wow, I think God's speaking to me. Like that person is a megaphone for the Lord. I know I, I had that feeling when Matthew Kelly was speaking uh, at our church. And I thought, and I said to our people, I think this is God's messenger. He's trying to get our attention and calls to conversion. This is really something. And this is what Matthew wants everyone to, to hear. That God speaking through John the Baptist, the message we need to hear. Just like Isaiah spoke many years ago when the Israelites were in Babylon, in exile, far away from their homeland because they have drifted away from God. And then God spoke through the prophet Isaiah to give them hope that they can prepare themselves to make straight the way of the Lord. That This is a homecoming that he prophesied. So now he's seeing that in the new light of John the Baptist, John now explaining there's even a greater coming home when Christ comes to us. An interesting little historical or cultural point. In ancient times, when a king planned to travel to the further ends of their kingdom, he would send a courier ahead of him, and they would tell the people that the king was coming and specifically to prepare the road so that the king was, could travel with his entourage. And so John picks up on that motif and says, prepare the way of your life so the Lord could come to you. Beautiful message. We're told that John wore a clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. If you were to read 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, this is exactly what Elijah wore. Now, Matthew, who's speaking to a primarily Jewish community, knows that everyone's familiar with that image. That's like the prophetic robe. And so he places John in that same garment. You know, not that they would have even noticed. There's The symbolism is what's important here. And that is that John has every bit of the invested power of a prophet who speaks for God. And he eats locusts and wild honey, which is kind of a definitely a, a monastic diet. You know, everything about John is wild. Even his food is wild honey, you know. And the amazing thing we have to notice here is that the next line is, Matthew says, at that time, Jerusalem, which is a far piece. It's a two-hour bus ride. I don't know how many miles that is, but it's quite a few. All of Judea, which is that whole southern region of Israel, and the whole region around the Jordan, which is quite encompassing, what we would call the West Bank, by the way, today, it's being fought over so much. All of the people in that area would come out to see John. Now, imagine that. Why would they come out to hear a man who would nearly insult them? It's the same thing that why did King Herod want to listen to John, even though it disturbed him so much? It's that it's something about when people preach, it's a two-edged sword. You know, it, it cuts right through all the stuff of life, but yet it, it cuts. It cuts. So it's hard to hear when a prophet really speaks. The question, of course, we want to be asking is, do we welcome the prophetic voice in our life? Is there anyone who can really speak the truth to us? You know, it's nice that when you're in dinner out in public, it's all, somebody goes like this, uh, Jimmy, you got some uh, spaghetti on your <laughs> chin, you know, or, um, or you got bad breath, or you've got, you know, who, who will care enough to tell you the truth? Now, some of us are blessed with all kinds of people who do that. <laughs> I'm in a, a parish right now. We're talking about the uh, things that I was trying something new. And I said, what do you think the people will accept this? I said, Father, these are Dutch people. They will tell you. They will tell you. I said, okay. As already noted, is the desert is not a place that you could easily or quickly or casually visit. The fact that so many people would create this beaten path to John certainly says a lot about what God's doing through this man. True? Now, is there some place, maybe, I like to think this might be such a place, 
not because of me, but because of the power of the gospel, because of what the Lord can do, teach and touch us in many ways that can call us to of conversion. But look at what John says. And first of all, you have the first people Matthew introduces us to among this motley crew of all kinds of people from all over that come are Pharisees and Sadducees. So who who are they? They happen to be two of the most powerful religious or political parties in Israel or Palestine at the time. Sadducees were from priestly families, usually of the aristocracy, the well-to-do, and they were associated with the temple. So when the temple was destroyed, which would be 70 AD, that was the end of the Sadducees. So they're not really a power to consider at the time that Matthew's writing his gospel 15 years later in year 85. But the Pharisees were. In fact, what we notice, and this is, again, a nice background note, uh, you will often see more in Matthew's gospel than any other of the gospels that Jesus really goes, or Matthew or Jesus goes after the Pharisees. Why is that? Well, Jesus certainly had very little patience for these people who were very devoted to the scriptures of the first five books of the Bible and the oral tradition that they built around that. In other words, you had all these laws in the Torah. In fact, Torah, you know, means law. And their way of saying to follow that law, let's make sure they follow it by all these other prescriptions, which is to say to keep yourself from falling over the cliff, let's build a fence around it, which makes sense, right? But so they said, in order to keep the Sabbath rest, let's make sure you only walk uh, no more than uh, this many meters a day. You're, you're going to lift this many pounds a day. You're going to do this. And it was very prescribed. And, and even so literally, remember, Jesus was constantly fighting the Pharisees because they kept him from doing God's work, healing on the Sabbath. And they went after him. So Jesus had little patience for these guys who were so rigid, so legalistic. You know anybody like that? <laughs> and even today, it's remarkable. You think we're beyond this, but there are people like that. But Matthew had even less favor for them. He had a great animosity for good reason. You see, uh, the Pharisees ultimately excommunicated the Messianic Jews, that they could no longer join them in synagogue or Sabbath worship. They could never longer, they believed, call themselves Jews, because they believed the Messiah came and, and the Orthodox Jews believed that wasn't so. So they were kicked out of their community, left high and dry on their own, which is terrible. I mean, imagine kicking someone out of our own parish community, what that would be like and how people would feel. This is how the early Christians were excommunicated. Imagine from their church, as it were, their, their religious community. So, anyway, that's the background and why John would have such uh, hard words to say to these people.
Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to Heart, hand in hand, praying for God.